Midday Madness. Tuesday, a bit of word association. Everything's settled now. After round three, take a deep breath. Where's your team? You can play along. 0433 98 11 16. And we'll take your calls as this hour unfolds. So Brisbane Lions, top of the ladder. Monstrous at the Gabba. The Lions are going to make a mess of the ill-equipped up north. Melbourne, ruthless response to a challenge. I think they'll like a challenge more than anything else as this season goes along. Ruthless, rapid response when when required. Clayton Oliver took his turn. Sam Wiedemann took his chance. Carlton, exhilarating in every way. You're going to live the full experience as Blues fans. I'm jealous of you. Up and down within games, it's going to be so much fun. Exhilarating in every way. Hawthorne, how brave. Enormous from so far back. Losing creates belief as much as winning in those circumstances. Fremantle, jury out. Not prepared to make any judgments on Fremantle with the wins over Adelaide and West Coast. Jury out. Collingwood lost nothing but the four points. Geelong, the Warriors came out to play. In the past 10 seasons, there have been 54 comebacks from 30-plus point deficits within games. The Cats have produced nine of them. The next best is five. Those circumstances do bring out the best in Geelong. The Sydney Swans, emotionally flat and not helped by the whistleblowers. St Kilda, not so plain now. Proper star factor in Max King. Gold Coast, pop gun attack. 10-9 10-9 from 60 inside 50s, 8-9 from 50 inside 50s in their past two weeks. Richmond, the issues are ominously familiar, and the coach is doing tongue-in-cheek policy, uh, politics, which I actually don't mind, but the issues are ominously familiar. Bulldogs, the mojo is back. They showed the hunt and the want for the contested ball. The Giants, that's a better way to play. Adelaide, the footy gods must be crazy. North Melbourne, boys against men. Port Adelaide, not a shadow of their former selves. And if 0-3 becomes 0-5, well, that doesn't bear thinking about. West Coast, impossible scenario. And Essendon, I'm sticking with don't invent a crisis. They found their game. Now they've got to put it to use and win the winnable games. (laughs) That wasn't a bad line at the end. Adam Simpson with us on 360 last night. Nathan Buckley, good morning. Good morning, Jared. And... The reality is that everyone has gone through it. It was that uh, West Coast and Fremantle were protected from it and by it. And, um, yeah, there was uh, no club is guaranteed an even run or a fair run, but over a long enough timeline, it all evens out. And this might simply be an evening out. But it doesn't make it any easier for them. Not for him right now. Uh, so we were just in the office beforehand and you raised the idea, don't get caught up in one result. One result can mean the world. So I thought we'll let, we're let we going to play with that oh, this don't morning. Worry. I, I'm, I'm very philosophical this morning. Um, <laughs> um, I've got a book called The Obstacle is the Way that is sitting on my desk. It's been, it's come into my space about two or three times. So I felt compelled to go and buy it. Um, and when you hear uh, Adam Simpson there talk about how the reality of their situation but that these are the positives that are coming from it and we can only deal with what we have in front of us. And then the prospect is that by having these struggles and by having these challenges that when you work through and come out the other side, that you're better off for it. Now, the 2022 season might be done by the time they come out the other side of it, but that doesn't mean that they're not better for it in the longer run. So it's there's a... I'm quite philosophical at the moment, Jared. We'll see where we get to. We will. We will. Okay. So if you're Adam Simpson right now, so you've had a challenging preseason with injury, which was going to be difficult to overcome in the early stages anyway. So you've probably had a little bit of time to get your head around that. And then you get hit by a scenario, which just simply can't be navigated. Um, We spoke just before the season started about don't fall into the the doom of it. And yet the doom of it is now very real. They're all living it. There's gallows humor might be the sort of the only yeah. way through it. Just put us inside Adam Simpson's scenario as, as you would see it. Well, I think the reframing of the challenge is the most important thing because you can't just go along being, you know, we keep losing games, boys. What's going, like, we need to be better than this. Like, you, because that is not 
a reframing. That is judging expectations or result, judging results on expectations that really can't be, can't be seen as legitimate or fair given the hurdles that West Coast are, are being asked to jump right now. We don't, we often f- overlook those challenges and hurdles and go to the professional aspect of the game and say, well, you've got to find a way to push through these struggles and get it done because that's your job. I think the reframing of it as a senior coach is important and he needs to reframe it for his players to the point where there's something for them to gain outside of the four points each week. That doesn't, and he said it last night, that, that doesn't mean that they're giving that up. It doesn't mean that they're not trying to win, but they are being realistic about it and judging themselves on what they are in control of and not what they're not. And, and the things that they aren't, control, aren't in control of are probably the reason why they're zero and three. Um, but that, that fine line is difficult, but the reframing becomes crucial um, and still the hope and belief that when we get the other side of this, what are we going to take with us from this that's going to have us better off when the things outside of our control are removed and we've got more things in our control? So clearly connection plays a role in that. So he spoke about the group never having been tighter. It feels like that's a real commonality with teams who are going well as the, they speak of the connection and the tightness within the player group. So sort of binding together in adversity and then the shared sense of mission out the other side. Yeah, and, and we love to hear about those stories when it results in the ultimate success. But those stories happen even with teams that don't make the ult- don't achieve the ultimate success in either the short, medium term. Um, so, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen because struggle and trauma and challenge creates growth. It is, it's, it's a, it's a definitive, it's a part of life, whether it's professional sport or, or, or otherwise. And what he would be saying is like, as a group, we've got to, we've got to look after each other here because we're in, you know, we're going through hell in a, in a professional sense, we're going through hell, but it's only, it's only a game and they're still in a very fortunate position. They're playing a professional sport. They're, they're with each other. You know, they don't have their best crew on the park and that's not looking great. And, they, and even blokes are coming back. are still a little bit crook and they've got the layover. I hope long, long COVID's not a thing because, you know, that's going to affect, um, that may affect them or, and everyone else. But I reckon, um, yeah, I reckon the reframing it is important and, and looking beyond yeah, the win loss right now is is crucial. Otherwise, you're going to lose you're going to lose hope, and you're going to feel like you're not good enough. And and if you if you lose that, you lose the group. Yep. And if a group loses itself, well, then all is lost. Yep. So in so in Adam's private moments, so he can't give voice to the how um, how overwhelming would be the sense of well, this is a wasted year. Um. They're not going to get a run at it till they're zero four zero five. He would definitely, he would definitely have that. So they've got Collingwood this week, right? So I mean, there there is there's still a possibility they can pull one out of the fire in this in this short stage. And if they were able to do that, it would have an enormous catalytic effect on what they do going forward potentially. Yep. But um, he would have had in my, in in his in his time like. Poor, the poor bugger me moments, like why is this happening? All of this work right now. Um, but I think as a senior coach or anyone in that environment, as a senior coach, as the leader, you have to absolve that within yourself first before you can lead. So if he couldn't do that and judge himself on things that he couldn't control, and that's it's, it's a human thing sometimes we get caught up focusing on things that are not in our sphere. But if he couldn't do that, well, then that would transmit into the club, into the team, and it would be detrimental. So clearly the way he spoke and the way he's speaking, he's been able to absolve himself of the things that they can't control and see a a higher purpose or a different purpose around the challenges that they're being presented with right now. And that's largely around what high performance is. How do you make the most out of the circumstances that you're given? And they're still with a high performance mindset, but starting from a much lower bar because of the resources at his disposal and their disposal. So that's the coaching reality of Adam Simpson. 
What about Ken Hinckley at the moment to further the, the initial conversation around the performance? How difficult would it be to avoid the sensation of the walls closing in when you've been a team who's been in preliminary finals and they don't look a shadow of that at the moment? Well, close to impossible because the walls do close in on you and there is expectation. There's, it, at the very least, there's internal expectation. So even if the walls don't close in, it's from the inside out that you're now questioning what what are we building from where we have come and what we've put up this year, what does that say about us? What are our prospects? Um, and where are we going to go? Have and, and then when the questions come about, have we got the right people in the right places? That's not quite going that well. That's not quite. Then you start looking at the, the parts that make up the whole rather than being unconsciously confident and believing of the parts that make up the whole and then you're able to perform. So when you do get conscious of, you know, is that what's, what's not working? Is it that? Is it this? Is it that? Is it this? You're taking your eye off the ball in many ways. Um, but that's, that's probably what they're going through at the moment. Um, and they don't have the excuses that West Coast have. So I would say that Port are in a much more difficult situation than West Coast are because you can't just slate it away to things outside of their control. What is self-preservation mode? Having said like that, you know, Charlie, Charlie Dixon's a big part of their their side and Alia Alia is a big part of their side. And um, yeah, But that is not being insurmountable for them or for other teams to, to miss a player here or there. Personnel um, does have a massive impact and some players are the glue that others... I mean, I saw, I saw Port Adelaide bombing to 45 metres out from goal in the last quarter. And it was like they thought that Charlie Dixon was still there and he was going to take a clunk or, or, or win a 1v4 contest and allow their smalls to get involved. But that, that, so there, there doesn't, doesn't look like there's enough acknowledgement of the shift in where they are and what they have to do. But Ken Hinckley at the moment, it's, it's, it's bloody hard yards. It's really hard yards for him. And the next, the, as I said, the next game becomes crucial. They need to win, win one, and just win one any way they possibly can at the earliest possible time. Yep. And it doesn't get any easier for them. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, so when you're actually starting to think, well, we, we're thinking about result and then you start, take your mind off process, you know, potentially that doesn't, that doesn't re, um, augur that well either. So it's, it's a really hard spot. How critical is it to avoid self-preservation mode? So the player, we, we, sometimes you can see players in that mode, but what about for a coach? Um, oh, no, for a coach, I, I don't, it, it's, you're in your quieter moments, you, you're, you're hardest on yourself. Like, so Ken will be beating himself up more than anyone else. And as long as he's got really good support and he stays open with his, with his team and his team being his assistant coaches, um, his football manager, um, yeah, there, there'll be confidants within the football club that he leans on and outside. But you need to make sure that you're looking after you first. If you're not maintaining your, uh, you know, really positive mindset, um, you know, a consistent exercise regime, sleeping well, you've got to, you, you can't afford to go into a hole because if you go into a hole, then you're going to, yeah, it's going to have a detrimental effect to everyone else because you're going to present as a lesser version of yourself. Yep. So that that's the hardest thing because you've got to be selfish to be selfless in that regard to look after you so that you can therefore look after everyone else. And when you're not going well is that's when it's, you need it the most. Yep. How hard is it living the public trial of, am I going to lose my job? I think that, I think that people in Melbourne feel like, I know that people in Adelaide or Adelaide or um, Perth feel like that this is a very Vic, still feel like it's a very Victorian centric league. And even when we get texts on here at times, you go, oh, we don't, we haven't spoken about Brisbane's performances. Or like, so we, we, we feel, everyone feels like we're Victorian centric. If Ken Hinckley was over here, we would be more aware of what is happening over in Adelaide. And without even being over in Adelaide, their the, the scrutiny on him right now and Port Adelaide, especially after losing a showdown in that manner and being zero on three, imagine anything that's happened here 
and and I reckon you can nearly ramp it up in a in a two team town. He would be under that much scrutiny and that much pressure um, that it's unfathomable. So in Melbourne, potentially we're we're protected from. You know, Hinkley doesn't seem to be copying much grief, but he's he would be copying it. I think once again, I go back to a disproportionate amount of credit or or blame going to the to the head guy, and only the internal environment of the football club would understand, in fact, what his contribution is for good or for bad. Um, and I get a sense that he's always been a player's man. He's always had really strong connections. He's always been able to create an emotive response with his players. And right now, there's a disconnect there somewhere. Whether it's yeah, you know, whether it's between coach and playing group, whether it's within the playing group, whether it's in their program, but they're they're missing something that has been a really strong part of Port Adelaide's makeup for his tenure. So, to suggest it's him is 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 a long bow to draw, I think. So we just need a little bit more time to understand exactly what's going on, and so to Port. Yep. In 2017, how? How real was the idea of I might lose my job in all of this for you? And how do you navigate it? How do you park it? When do you, yeah, when, when does it get you? And when, when do you sort of have the clarity to leave that and actually do the job? Yeah. I think there's a difference between being under pressure to do the job and being under pressure to keep the job, which is a nuance, which is not often, but then every now and then there's an example of both. Yeah. And I think that that is, I think that that is more exaggerated from the outside, I, I don't think the nuance of that is, is is significant internally. But it there was no doubt in seventeen that um, that it's it, it crept into. You talk about the walls closing in; it crept into the environment. So it was, and and I was quite open. Like um, I was quite open with the playing group about you know this second half of this year is about us coming together and continuing to try and build something and there's no guarantee that you know this group isn't going to be together there's no guarantee I'm going to be here again so I'm going to enjoy this and throw everything into it because I feel really grateful and fortunate to be in my position and it was a real mind shift for me midway through that that year that I and I got up in front of the playing group and I said look there's no guarantee I'm going to be here and there's no guarantee any of you are going to be here and there's no we don't there's, we don't know what's going to happen between now and then so let's just enjoy it for what it is um, come together and try and build something and move forward as a, as an organisation. We don't we don't know if we're going to play finals, but we actually set ourselves to be the best defensive side in the competition in the last seven rounds of the year. Um, and we had a couple of KPI measures, and and we we, we got close to achieving, but we can't. So it, once again, it's just reframing. Um, but I think my capacity to let it go, to accept that I couldn't control whether I was going to keep the job or not and to decide that I was going to enjoy the experience for whatever was left of it and be grateful for it. I think that had a, it had a massive shift on me yeah. and I know that that had a massive shift on us because we had some really, we actually had a, some, a really strong end to the end of that year. Uh, we beat Melbourne in the last game of that season, which was a really good way to, to knock we actually took they they didn't make finals because we we won that game so they were they were a finals team or a finals prospect at that stage um so i think when people talk about the change between 17 and 18 it happened earlier than that yep. um and the group were, were happy to come along with with that mindset of you know being a little bit more grateful of, with what we're doing rather than having an expectation for an outcome matt's with us in williamstown welcome to you matt thanks guys uh, Bucks, love your insights and just wanted to pick your brain on, on two questions. Uh, with the Port Adelaide, they talk about the loss of players and um, how the pressure is on Hinkley. How much of a loss would uh, Michael Voss be? And the second, and how much would that influence the performance? And the second part of the question is, is the value of assistant coaches understated in the public media because I feel like we only hear about them when their names are getting thrown around for a, a head job. Um, I think you've made a couple of really great points there. Um, so Vossi coming to Carlton, Jared Schofield went back to West Coast. And th so the, at the very least, before you even think about the names and and the impact that we have no idea of because we're not in there, only the people that are in the environment would know, the dynamic shifts. When you lose people in key roles, 
um, that have high contact hours with the players and in the environment and bring an own, bring their own energy um, and you get used to that and it's a positive one and then the and then they leave then the dynamic has to shift and you need to create a new dynamic so that doesn't mean that the people that have replaced those guys don't have a great energy and a positive impact but it just takes time to settle again so that may well be a consideration um, yes we do underrate assistant coaches, line coaches, development coaches, the relationships that these guys form with the players to be their mentors, to um, walk with them along their journey of wanting to be the best footballer they can be and the best people they can be is profound. The senior coach doesn't actually, he has to step back and, and go across the group and across the staff, which allows the assistant, the assistant coaches, development coaches, the welfare guys to dig a bit deeper with individuals. The, the, the senior coach is probably working really closely with their leaders in, in some sense, but you're not, you're not teaching them how to pick the ball up. You're not teaching them about handball and kicking and that, or even how, how you're going to play as a full forward. These are things that are hand, handed over to your, your coaching group or handed over to your, your development boys to get that done. So the connection between the assistant coaches and the players is in many ways, well, it absolutely is more hands-on than the senior coach. Um, so when they move, it moves. There, there, is a, there is a shift for the players. Matt, thanks for your call. We'll take a few more as we go through. Just could you tell us the name of the book again, Bucks? There's a few. Uh, yeah, it's the, the, the latest one is The Obstacle is the Way. I haven't started reading it yet, so I don't, don't recommend it, but it's definitely come into my sphere. Um, and the other one I keep throwing up that people should read is the, the courage to be disliked. Yes, yeah, so so I read that one with me. <laughs> yeah. Very simple, basic book, but it's got some great stuff. In it, it does. There's a couple of pages in there that are dog eared in my copy. Oh. There's just two or three pages that spoke to me that I'll just go back to every now and then. I'm not a, I'm not a vociferous reader. I don't go, I don't know why. I, I just, um, every now and then I just, one finds itself into my space and yeah. just go, yeah, yeah, I needed to read that. It was good.